And uh, we're going to be talking on this series called Mercy Matters. And we're going to be looking over the next few weeks, uh, five weeks in particular, uh, on what it means to live in the mercy of God and what the mercy of God is all about in our lives. And I I would look at the scripture, and when I do, we see that mercy is like a vast topic. It's not something small in the Bible, amen? And so I would encourage you to try to be here four out of the five weeks that we will be in this series, because I believe that if you can grab a hold of a true understanding of the mercy of God, it'll change things in your life, amen? It'll change things in your life. So I encourage you. For today, I want to talk to you on a simple topic that I've entitled, we're going to start low, right, called mercy moves. Now, in the streets or in the hood, or in life, or on social media, when you're making moves, right, people are like, making moves, right? Or, you know, big money moves. You get a new job, and somebody puts a new job, and put a little paper stack of money. Big money moves. You know, the little, whatever you guys do these days, these kids. And so, <laughs> and so, I want to talk about God's big move. Like, what's God's big move in my life, in your life? And God's big move, right? is that he lavished mercy on us. And we're going to look at from the inception of the Bible, from the beginning of the Bible, from the genesis of it, like where God talks about mercy and what mercy is. Now, in order for us to be on the same page, of course, I got to tell you what I'm defining mercy as over the next five weeks, okay? So mercy for us, it's this compassionate disposition to forgive or offer help. It's the compassionate disposition of God To not just forgive us, but then after he's forgiven us, to offer help to us and to people in need, right? I often say that the mercy of God is God not giving us what we deserve. The mercy of God is God not giving us what we deserve. We deserve punishment based on our sin. We deserve damnation, but his mercy is so great that he doesn't give us that. Now, mercy is deeper than God just not giving us what we deserve, right? Mercy for God is a bigger thing. Mercy is an inherent quality of God. Mercy is something that God is actually, it's a part of the fabric of who he is. It's not an emotion to God. It's something he does. It's not just punishment withheld. It's about him extending help in replacement of punishment. Right, that's God. Like, he's not wanting to to beat us up. He sees our mess like like a loving dad. And he comes and he wants to offer us the help. Now, our text, our verse for today is in Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, we we find the story of Israel. And in this time of Israel, they just messed up really bad. Somebody say real bad. It was one of those ooh moments. Like, that's just me. Okay, I'm, I'm aging myself there. Praise God. And they're just like, ooh, and they're all being really bad. And God's like so upset with Israel. He's like, I'm done with them. And Moses is like, chill, God, like this is not good. And so he goes into the tent of meeting, he begins to pray, and he's interceding on behalf of other people. And we find our first verse in Exodus 33, 19, and then we're going to jump over to Exodus 34, just in verse 6, reading two verses, amen? In Exodus 33, 19, he's having a conversation with God, and he asks God this big question. He says, Lord, he said, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. And here's the response of God in verse 19 of Exodus 33. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So Moses asked God for something. God says, I'm going to do it. Now we see God doing it in verse 30, uh, chapter 34, verse 6. This is really key. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. Somebody say amen. Amen. Forgiving iniquity, that means the inner sins, and transgressions, that's the outer sins, and sin, right? But who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of fathers, meaning the father's inner sins, right, on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. Really quickly, that last part, that's why you can have a whole family of of alcoholics. Sin passes down. It's so important for us as fathers, somebody say fathers, to get before the Lord and repent of our sins that we don't pass the foolishness to our children. Amen? That's, That's a freebie. All right. 
Now, in these verses that we just read, it's, it's loaded with so much, but we got to do our best to focus in on what our topic is, which is God's mercy. The first thing we realize in, in verse 19 of chapter 33 is that God tells Moses that I'm going to let all of my goodness pass before you. Now, the goodness of God is the glory of God. God's glory, right, is how good he is. Moses says, I want your glory, and God says, I'll show you my goodness. So in God's mind, those two things are synonymous. They're the same thing, right? And he says, I- I'm going to show you the good things about me, and I want you to see that. Now, first off, Moses' prayer is wild by itself, with him having the audacity as a man to ask God to see the glory of God, the holiness of God. And God says something powerful, though, to, to Moses. And we sometimes read over it. He says, I'll be gracious to whom I'm going to be gracious to. And I'll be merciful to those I'm going to be merciful to. He says, he says, I'll show you my goodness. But by the way, FYI, in case you did not know, I only show my grace and mercy to who I decide to. Now, for a moment here, this might make God seem arbitrary, but it's not. It's God actually saying that whoever has received grace and mercy should know that they're the object of that grace and mercy and that he chose to give it to you. It does not mean that God has some people he ain't going to give grace and mercy to. What it means is that every person that he has given grace and mercy to is that they are the object of God's mercy. In the English version, it sounds like God's being arbitrary, but in the Hebrew, it's this idea that God is is showing this great amount of mercy and he's imparting this willingness to be able to be merciful to men like you and me. Amen? Amen. And here's one of the things, that God's mercy is bound up with his covenant people. When we enter into a covenant, an agreement with God, right? Right now we're in the covenant of grace, the salvation covenant with Jesus. Then when we accept Christ as our Savior, we then become the objects of God's mercy. Outside of Jesus, I cannot experience the fullness of God's mercy because God's mercy is bound up inside of covenant. And so when I accept Jesus as my Savior, I really experience the mercy of God. Now, sinners, people who don't know Jesus, right, they experience the mercy of God because in a a prevenient way, in that they're not destroyed upon the moment of their sin, and God gives them time to repent. That's God's mercy also. But the fullness of God's mercy is experienced, right, when you're in covenant relationship with God. And here's the cool part in my eyes about that is that God is looking to be in covenant with me. That God is looking to be in agreement with me, right? That this mercy of God, the disposition of God, that he would want to offer me forgiveness and help. There is help after my forgiveness. Jesus doesn't just forgive your sins and leave you by yourself. He forgives your sins and helps you walk out this Christian life. He leaves the Holy Spirit to do something in your life. Now, amazingly, God tells Moses that he will allow all of his goodness to pass before Moses. And this is so key for you to know. We hear this all the time. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, right? Book of Romans, it's the goodness of God. It's not people telling you how bad you are that leads you to to, to want Jesus. It's not church telling you how filthy you are that leads you to need Jesus. It's how good God is that makes you want to be a part of what God is doing. But here's the cool part, that God says, this is a freebie too. This is a nugget you can take for the rest of your life, all right? This is so cool in my eyes, right? He says, I'll make my goodness pass before you. And then he says, I only show grace and mercy to who I want to. God's goodness is is two parts, one part grace, one part mercy. God's goodness is grace and mercy. And so he says, my goodness, I'm going to let it pass before you. And then here's the amazing thing. The first thing, this is where we're going to get to our topic, like laser focus. The first thing that God exposes about himself to a man in covenant relationship at the level of of just him and Moses, which the Bible says they used to meet face to face like friends do. He says, I am the Lord, the Lord, merciful. Now, I don't know about you, but when you meet somebody for the first time, you try to put your best foot forward. I remember meeting my mother-in-law for the first time. And I wanted to put my best foot forward. Bought a new shirt. Put your best foot forward. You know what I'm saying? I'll pay for the meal. Put the best foot forward, right? I'll take the door. I got the door for you and your daughter. Don't worry. Don't touch this doorknob right here. I got this. Right? You, you get what I'm saying? You want to show the best side of you. Now, some of you do that because we're fake, and that's okay. God's working on you. That's all right. I'm just, that was a, that was a joke. I got to take that out my notes. Praise God. Don't use that for the second service. Okay. But God says, hey, Moses, 
I'm merciful. The first thing God tells Moses about his glory is that he's a merciful God. Now, I don't know about you, but that lets me know that mercy in God's eyes is really big. He didn't say grace first. He didn't say I'm loving. He said I'm merciful. I'm I'm not going to give you what you deserve because if it was based on that, like you would be destroyed. And so he says, I want you to, I'm merciful and I'm gracious. And then everything else he says is a result of the mercy and grace of God. He says, I'm slow to anger. Well, he's slow to anger because he's rich in mercy. You cannot be slow to anger if you don't have mercy. So some of you who are quick to anger, I just solved your problem. You lack mercy. You lack the mercy of God. And, and this is cool because the mercy of God is an attribute of God. When, when we talk about attributes, it simply means that it's one of the inherent qualities of God. It's who God, it's in the character of God, right? It's so important. From God's mercy flows God's grace. From God's grace flows God's ability to be slow to anger and so forth. Mercy, right, is God's desire to forgive us of our sins and help us. It's a deep-seated part of who God is, and so he does not destroy us based on that mercy. Here's point number one. If you're new here, I preach with three points. Here's point number one, that mercy is God's mentality. It's not an afterthought. My wife gets on me all the time because my mentality is not to come home and clean dishes. And I come in because I'm Puerto Rican by the back door. And I pass the kitchen, and there could be trash overflowing. There could be dishes overflowing. And, and my wife keeps a clean house. And, and, and when I grew up, I, I was in a clean house, not so much, like, in my mind to, like, do it all the time. And so I walk by that, and it's like the kitchen's clean to me. Because I have priorities. First, take off my jacket. Second, kick the dog off my leg. Third, hug my kids and roll around on the floor with them. Right? So that's me. And she's just like, Lewis, the dishes. And I'm like, we had a great time with the kids while you were away at practice, at the band practice, babe. Me and the kids had a great time. She's like, but you didn't do the dishes. And I'm like, yeah, but mercy, like, please. <laughs> right? It's not my mentality to do that first. Now, God's mentality is mercy first. See, I'll, let me make a street example for you. Okay, praise God. When you're out in public and somebody does something to you that angers you, is your response first mercy, or is it like, listen, if you don't act right, I'm about to choke you. I'm about to climb over this counter, and, and you're not going to know what church I go to because, right? And so what's your mentality? God's mentality, right, the inner quality of his heart, the, the, the lens by which he looks through things is mercy. He says, I'm the God merciful. When I, when I had my first child, I began to understand mercy even more because I recognized my daughter's full dependence on me and her mom. Right? Apart from me, she would, she would, she would die. Apart from my mother, or her mother rather, and me, they, she wouldn't have a way to live. And so the mercy of God for the believer is much like that in that we have to fully lean on God's mercy because we know what we deserve, but God doesn't give it to us. And so my daughter needed food and changing, right? She, when she cried, it pulled on the attribute of God that he shared with me because God's so good, he shares some of those things with us. And my mercy, my compassion, oh, my baby needs me. And you would go to them, right? As she grew older and could talk and when she acted bad, I had mercy on her. I should beat you, but I'm not going to because I love you. And I want you to know that dad needs you to get things together. I had a moment with her this morning. I've been, I pray in the morning, and, and I put my music on with the kind of a, I put it loud enough so that it'll wake them up, because <laughs> it's just better to wake up to music than to dad jumping in your bed, whatever. And so uh, she comes down this morning late, and she's running down the stairs. I'm like, what's wrong? What's, what's the matter? And she's like, it's her prayer time. Did you think I forgot? I'm like, you got eye boogers. You forgot, kid. Like, yeah, you forgot. But it's, it's, it's those moments like that that I know that that the mercy that I'm showing her, right, the work of God in my life is overflowing into her life. It's, it's the character of God in me coming into her life and that, that we have to understand God's a master of mercy, right? That, that God, when he thinks about us, is from this lens of mercy first, not judgment. And that's where the church often fails. We, we think judgment first rather than mercy first, right? When I was a kid, they would tell you, man, you're gonna, God's going to get you. If, you. if you do, you're going to go to hell. I'm just like, well... 
How about you just tell me about heaven first before you tell me about hell and that I can make my choice? Mercy first. God is so good. Why would you want to sin? God is so good. Why would you want to walk in disobedience? He's a good father, amen? The beauty of God's mercy is that in God's sovereignty, meaning God's absolute control and authority to govern all things, right, he shows mercy to who he pleases. And here's the great part. It pleased him to show mercy to you. It literally pleases God. He said, I only show mercy to whom I please. It pleased God to show mercy to you. And right there, some people may ask, like, why do I need God's mercy? Pastor, why do I need mercy? mercy from this God that you speak of. And I'm really glad that you asked that because you guys really, on Sunday mornings, you ask great questions. And, and the reason is, is simple because at the root of God's mercy is God withholding punishment from sin. Right? And so at the root of mercy is this idea. See, the root of mercy is God withholding punishment. The fruit of mercy is God extending forgiveness. The root of mercy, God withholding punishment. The fruit of mercy, God extending forgiveness. And God says, you know what? Man, because of the fall of Adam, we've had this issue of sin. And because of this sin, sin being things that transgress or violate the, the, the holiness of God, the law of God, right? That God extends mercy for the messes in our life, for the mistakes, for the sins. Like God's mercy is for our mess. God's mercy is not because we had it all together. It's because we did not have it all together. God's mercy is because we often make mistakes. And even, even after we've been in church for a long time, we willingly keep on making some mistakes. And God's like, I'm going to give you mercy. And for those of you who are in this room and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you've walked away from faith, that the mercy that you have is for you to come back to God and to re-recognize the goodness and the glory of God and how much he loves you. It's his mercy. You see, the punishment we deserve is because we engage in sin. Or we choose to live in a, in a way that we know doesn't please God, but we also don't care about it. Maybe you don't know that what you're doing doesn't please God, but once you become aware of what you're doing that doesn't please God, and we don't stop it, those are the moments where God says, I'm extending mercy to you. You see, the messes of many of us in this room who might profess Jesus but still dabble in little sins. Small things that we think don't really matter. We call them white lies or little lies. And, and we try to rationalize what we do because based on what other people do. But last time I checked in the book of Revelations, when I stand before God, you won't be there. And so me rationalizing what I do based on what you do, is it going to work in God's eyes? And God's like, man, you got messes all across your life. You deserve, we all deserve immediate discipline and, and, and we deserve like damnation according to scripture and according to God's holy law. But God is so good and he's so rich in mercy that instead he extends mercy. The psalmist, he cried out for mercy because he knew he had a mess, right? In the book of Psalms, he cries out for mercy repeatedly because he knew he had messes in his life. We need mercy, but who does God show mercy to? Here's point number two, right? Here's point number two. God shows mercy to those willing to confess their mess. 1 John 1, 9, uh, amazing passage of scripture where, where John, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Consider the words of the psalmist in Psalms 25, verse 6. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from old. He recognizes the, the, how ancient God's mercy is, right? He says, remember not the sins of my youth, somebody say amen, amen. or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. He's saying, God, because of your mercy, would you not remember my sins? Would you give me the forgiveness? He's confessing right there. Psalms 51 verse 1, David writes, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. He says, according to your mercy, God, erase my sin from my life. According to your mercy, God, erase the memory, somebody say amen, amen. of my sins. You see, when you come to God and you ask God to forgive you of your sins, 
He blots out your sins. He doesn't remember them anymore. And what, what's, what the enemy of our soul loves, loves to do is he reminds you of things that God has totally forgotten about. He reminds you of things that God has totally forgotten about. And you're bound up by the ideas of who you used to be rather than the reality of who God has made you to be. But there's mercy for us. David in Psalms 51, he knew this idea of mercy, that it's, it's forgiveness and it's help. And he says, God, according, in accordance with your mercy, would you offer me the help that I need to get past this? You see, if we confess, he forgives. It's so simple, right? Some here today, maybe you've never made that commitment to Jesus. Maybe you've never, like, said a sinner's prayer and confessed sins and, and, and said, I want to be a, a, a follower of Jesus. And, and today, maybe that's what you do if you say, hey, I want to find an experience and live in the mercy that God offers. And some here today, maybe you're saved and you love God, but still you don't live in that mercy because you still dabble in the messes of your life. Today, maybe you, you realign your life and you be intentional about your confession and say, God, I want, I need more mercy because I know that my life isn't where it should be in every area because there's lingering love of the world. You see, many of us need mercy for how we speak to our spouse. Many of us need mercy for how we think about our bosses at work. Many Christians need mercy for how they talk to their coworkers. You see, mercy is not a moment. Mercy is like a momentum that God gives us. It's a continuing thing that just, oh, mercy. This is a great verse where it says in the Bible, his mercies are new every morning. I told y'all before, like, you know, my father used to give me a pop in the morning. And he used to say, for all the things you're going to do. <laughs> right? But God, before you wake up every day, he gets the best cup he can find. He puts it on your bedside. And he fills it with mercy for you. And the Bible says, every day the mercies of God are new every morning. And the reason is because he knows you're going to need it because he knows how messy we can be. It doesn't make the mess okay. It doesn't justify the mess. Well, I got this mercy for my mess. The, the goal of mercy in our lives should be that when God comes to refill my cup, I didn't use as much as the day before. His mercies are new every morning. See, God's greatest mercy move was that he knew that we were literally eternally damned apart from him. I always explain it like this, and this is the easiest way to understand why Jesus had to die for sins. This is the easiest way to understand this, right? You've heard me say it before, so just bear with me and just say amen. If I offend Elder Daniel, when he dies, that offense dies because he's dead. When I offend God because God never dies, it's an eternal offense. When I sin against God, it's an eternal thing because God don't die. He's forever and ever. And so only Jesus, an eternal sacrifice, could satisfy the payment for sin that is eternal. And in his mercy, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that any who would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Jesus comes in, and he steps in and pays the price for our sins. Now, I don't know about you, that's mercy. And if that story ever gets old as a Christian, you're missing the mark. If that... At any point in your walk with God, you can hear that and just be like, yeah, I heard that before. We're missing the depth of what God has done for us. Because there ain't no way on this earth I'm giving any of my kids for any of y'all. But he gave his only son. That if any would believe in him, meaning that they would put their faith in what he did and not what they do. Because my good deeds don't matter in God's eyes. How good I am could never erase the sin that I've committed. The only thing that could erase that sin is me having faith in the 
work of Jesus on the cross. Micah, an Old Testament prophet, says in Micah 7, verse 8, and I'm reading this from the King James Version. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever. Thank you, Jesus. Here's why God's not always angry. Here's why. Because he delights in mercy. To delight in something means to find it as a source of joy. God sees being merciful as a source of joy for him. He delights. He loves showing mercy to you and to me. He likes making mercy moves in your life, right? We deserve one thing, but because of this great mercy of God, right? We, we, we stand condemned by the testimony of Jesus to a degree in that we realize that we have an issue of sin. And if we don't take care of it, then what Christ has done condemns us that we did not believe in him. Although he came to set us free, he came to give us freedom. If we don't partake in what he gave us and what he offers us by virtue of that, we're choosing eternity apart from God. And that's judgment. But here's this crazy verse in James 2.13, James being the brother of Jesus who once did not believe in his big brother being God and thought he was crazy and then became a believer after the death and resurrection of God, of Jesus, right? After that, you should be a believer. It says, for judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. But then he says this, mercy triumphs over judgment. That God's mercy is more powerful and greater than the judgment that we face. And so he takes that mercy, gives it to us, takes our judgment, puts it on Jesus. And now we can overcome. And now we can walk free from all the things that have bound us up in our lives because of this mercy of God. And God made a mercy move by giving us Jesus. Here's my final point that I'll close with. God's mercy move moved us. That God's mercy move, like his big move, it moved me and you. It moved me from, from being lost to being found. It, it moved me from death to life, from a sinner to a son. Right? It, it moves me from being damned to being destined, from cursed to blessed. Like it moves me. It moves me in my heart the mercy move of God that I should be cursed but instead I'm living blessed beyond belief because of the mercy of God and God who is rich in mercy he lavishes it on us he pours it out on us knowing that he would take no pleasure in my death in my damnation in my destruction in its place he says I'll be merciful to you Lewis if you receive my mercy beloved are you receiving the mercy of God this morning have you Ask the mercy of God to come in. And say, Jesus, I want to partake of your mercy. I want to partake of your heart. I want to accept forgiveness in every area of my life. And I want to reestablish our relationship rooted and grounded in this mercy that you offer us. Isn't it good to have a merciful God? Slow to anger. Amen. And he's gracious to us. Come on, stand with me this morning as the prayer team comes up as quickly as they can. Man, God who was rich in mercy. God who was rich in mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you're new, we're here today. Um, we're going to pray for whoever needs prayer for any area of your life. We've been here since very early in the morning, preparing our hearts to be able to pray with you and to be people who can touch your life. And so maybe you need prayer for an area of your life that doesn't pertain exactly to what we're talking about right now. Maybe it's not about the mercy of God right now. Maybe you need area of your life, prayer for healing, prayer for something happening. But I want to tell you, we want to pray for that. Amen. And you can feel free to come. In a moment, I'm going to pray. I'll say amen. You can come down this center aisle. But here's, here's what I'll say to you right now. If there's anybody in this room who you're unsure of your salvation, you're unsure of where you'll spend eternity if you 
went to meet Jesus today. If you're unsure of that, I want to tell you that you can receive the mercy of God today. And I know that you can probably say a sinner's prayer from your seat, but there's something about taking a step of faith and coming to the, to the altar and saying, God, I, I, I'm just taking this surrender walk and I'm, I need you to move in my life. In an area that's smaller, great, God, I need you to move. Maybe you've got areas, maybe you're saved and you love Jesus, right? And you know you're going to heaven, but you got some other mess you know that you got to fix. Maybe you need mercy for your messy attitude. Praise God. Maybe you need God to do some things in your life. If you need mercy over any sphere of your life, I'm telling you, God wants to speak to you. And we want to pray with you. Amen? Amen? amen. Come on, let's bow our heads. And as soon as I say amen, you can come receive prayer. Don't wait for nobody else. It's between you and God. Have a holy boldness to know he's, he, he loves to show you mercy. Father, we are so grateful for everything you're doing in the midst of our church. So grateful for the words you're speaking over us today of mercy, God. But I just ask you now that every son and daughter in this room who doesn't know you, God, hasn't made a confession. Maybe they've walked away from faith. Maybe they've known church in the past and they haven't known Jesus. Maybe they have spent years apart. I, I pray that your spirit would touch them right now and they would just take a step of faith and they would come. They would come and receive prayer, Father God. They would come and accept you as their Lord and Savior. I just pray right now, God, that even those who may be in any other area of your life who are lacking your mercy, maybe we just want an impartation of your mercy today, God. If that be the case, God, that you would bring them to come boldly in Jesus' name. Come on, the church says.